Well, hello there, and welcome to the um, second webinar in the Assessment Cluster Learning Series. So thank you so much for joining us. This um, webinar is certainly number two of three webinars in which we are looking to really give you the skills and the knowledge and the um, background confidence to be able to understand the area of assessment within the VET sector. So thank you so much for joining us, and ultimately, in the um, last webinar, we took we took a look at um, ultimately what is assessment and why do we do it. We looked at the roles and responsibilities for you as a trainer and assessor in the area of assessment. We looked at the concept of mapping. We looked at what are the components of a unit that need to be assessed, and and we got a sense of how we would assess particular aspects of a unit. We looked at the different stakeholder conflicts that might exist um, in the area of assessment. And we looked at the criteria of what a good test would be and also what a good answer would look like. We all, now, we also talked about the fact that assessment is one of the most critical areas for an RTO to get right because naturally how the RTO is assessing its candidates will have a direct impact on its compliance results and how it is audited when it comes to um, facing an audit from ASQA. Okay? Now, we also need to remember that definitely we do provide training, but the ultimate um, key performance indicator of good quality training is how well the assessments can be answered. So we need to make sure that the assessments are uh, reflective of the training and reflective of the skills and knowledge that a student would need within industry. Okay, so in this particular webinar, we're going to go through choosing the best assessment methods. We're going to look at how you would create an assessment that is appropriate to the context and choosing the right method because we've talked about the fact that there's many different methods of assessment. Um, we're going to look at how you can create very level appropriate questions and I'm going to talk to you about different instructional design words that you can use to create your assessment questions. We're also going to look at um, making sure that again your assessments meet what's called the principles of assessment and also making sure that as much as possible you're gathering good quality evidence from your candidates all right so in the third webinar we're going to be looking at more of the policies and procedures about assessment but this webinar is really the nuts and bolts as to um, the structure of developing your assessments okay so let's get straight into it as always, have a notepad available as you are going through the webinar. Feel free to pause it as many times as you want and re-listen to particular sections and even print out the slides and um, have them available for you to make notes against um, as you go through. Okay, have a do not disturb sign on your desk to make sure that you really value this time um, that you're putting into your own study and uh, that you have no disruptions. All right, so assessment. As we've talked about, it's one of the most critical areas to get right within an RTO, and there's so many different components to assessment. Being able to write great quality assessments is certainly a skill in itself, and a skill that you get better and better at over time. And assessments, as much as possible, you want to remove all subjectivity, and you want to make it a very objective process. You want to make sure that all assessors are assessing in a similar way and if not exactly the same way and you need to learn to develop assessment um, documents that are very prescriptive and the student knows exactly what needs to be done and the assessor knows exactly how to assess it. Okay? So as we talked about last time there's a number of different ways that we can assess people. We can assess them through written tests, essays, multiple choice questions, verbal interview questions, practical tests, simulated tasks, games, portfolios, projects, presentations, observations in the workplace and role plays. Now which method of assessment that you choose is going to depend on the unit of competency itself and what needs to be assessed. Okay? So um, an observation may not be appropriate for every single unit of competency. Um, a role play may be better. A um, written test may be better for some aspects of the knowledge component. But again, a written test may not be appropriate for all types of um, knowledge aspects. All right? 
now we just need to make the best appropriate decision and there's no perfect decision however we need to be able to justify and show to ASQA um, whenever we are creating assessments that we are covering off all of the information all of the criteria of the unit okay because that's essentially what we are looking to do assess the unit uh, sorry assess the student against every component of the unit of competency okay so now let's have a very frank discussion about the frustrations with assessment methods because no assessment method is ever going to be perfect and there is always going to be pros and cons to it so for a written test practical observation well, let's check it out let's have a think about what are some of the frustrations that an assessor may face or a student may face in each of these different modes of assessment all right, so I just want to pose that question to you and get you to write down what could be three frustrations for a written test and three frustrations for an observation, okay? So if you want to, um, feel free to press pause now and write down your answers for each. So three for a written and three for a practical observation. Okay, so once you've done that, now let's have a chat about what you came up with. Now, ultimately, for a written test, some of the um, disadvantages can be, and the frustrations can be, that certainly some students can have stress around assessments and their performance can be impacted because they are just not comfortable with, with written tests. Some students also have maybe challenges in the areas of reading and writing and may not have a strong academic background, so um, completing a written test may be a struggle for them. Another one could be the amount of time that's required to complete the written test, because um, generally they take quite a bit of time. Okay. Um, some other ones can be that it's quite easy to misinterpret questions and provide an answer that may not be exactly what the assessor is looking for. Let's go practical observation. What are some frustrations with that? Well, with this, first of all, it can be very hard to create the exact situation that may be required. So for example, maybe you need to assess um, someone outdoors and maybe you need to watch them doing something. Well, let's imagine that the weather is bad on that day. What are you gonna do? All right, obviously you're gonna need to have a, um, a strategy around that. Let's imagine that you need particular resources to do that. And those resources are rather expensive. Okay? Um, let's imagine that you have a situation where you need other people to be involved in the observation. Sometimes it's very hard to predict exactly what those people are going to do. And if it was observation in the workplace, let's imagine that it was at a coffee shop and you need to see um, the uh, candidate serve a number of people and make particular types of coffee. Well, there's no guarantee that um, during that particular shift they're going to make those particular types of coffee. Okay, so there's a number of different challenges that come up regardless of the method that we use, and we need to as much as possible cover all of our bases and also in the area of written or even in practical, we need to make sure that a student feels comfortable and able to complete the assessment tasks. Okay, so I just sort of bring that up because a lot of times people are. Uh, I don't really give much um, thought to the um, frustrations and the complications that come from the different methods of assessment that we choose. All right. So, for example, a role play, great idea, but unless a student is very well um, instructed and uh, clearly told what's expected of them, the probability of success of the role play may not be great. Okay, and. Certainly nothing beats um, a live um, demonstration, um, a live, um, dem I guess, uh, observation in the real world. However, again, that is very hard to predict and control as well, all right? So just remember, with all types of assessments, there's always gonna be downfalls and um, advantages at the same time, okay? So terminology, now, as part of assessment, we have um, two major um, terms that we need to become very familiar with. Okay, so there is assessment tools and assessment instruments. Okay, and it's very easy, very, very easy to confuse the two. However, 
by confusing them, um, you are going to create a lot of misunderstandings. Okay, so ultimately, the assessment tool is the everything, and what I mean by that is, think about it this way: the assessment tool is all the components put together. So as it says here, the overarching document usually includes mapping instructions to candidates, plagiarism policy, student declaration, it includes all the instruments, often also includes marking guides, benchmark answers as well. So everything put together for the unit is called the assessment tool. All right. Now, within the assessment tool, you are gonna have a lot of individual assessment instruments. Okay. So, for example, you're going to have observation checklists, written tests, third-party checklists, case studies, verbal interview questions, and all these different methods of assessment, these are all assessment instruments. Okay. So, as part of your course for the TA, you will be required to actually develop assessment tools, which will include all the different methods of assessment that you decide. So for example, you will be required to create an assessment tool for three units, which implies you'll need to create, for example, an observation checklist, for example, a written test, for example, a third party report. All of this will certainly be explained to you as part of the course, but if somebody says to you, I want you to make an assessment instrument, or I want you to make an assessment tool, you need to be very aware in your own mind that the assessment tool covers everything in the unit and covers multiple methods of assessment. The assessment instrument itself is just one piece of um, a document that we would need for assessing someone, okay? And you're always gonna have multiple assessment instruments. Okay. So hopefully that's made sense. Um, it's a concept that uh, you will get used to over time and more and more familiar with. But if someone says, I want you to make an assessment, you can say, awesome. And it's, do you want the assessment tool or the assessment instrument? Okay. So something to keep in mind there. All right. Now let's look at choosing the best method of assessment. All right. Now, as we talked about previously, what needs to be assessed from a unit? Well, ultimately, the first thing that we always need to think about is the performance evidence, okay? And most performance evidence is usually assessed by you know, practical observation, and so that would infer simulated tasks, games, fault-finding activities, presentations, role plays, um, anything that's going to be active and we can watch someone do it. Okay. And choosing the best method, well, for knowledge, evidence, and the performance um, criteria, we'd often use written tests, case studies, projects. Okay. You can certainly use a project in um, the performance evidence as well. All right. Now, let's look at a couple of examples, and let's have a look through the units of competence to actually make some clear decisions as to how we would, how we would assess each item. So, last time we looked at the unit um, BSP ADM organized meetings okay so we looked through this and we came down to the assessment conditions and we read through this assessment must be conducted in a safe environment where evidence gathered demonstrates consistent performance of typical activity experience in the general admin field of work and includes access to office equipment and resources all right so we would have to make sure that throughout our assessment um, the students had access to office equipment and resources all right. So the next thing we do is look at performance evidence, read through this, and this kind of tells us that we would have to watch a student organize a meeting, uh, prepare and distribute all the documentation, um, take meeting notes, uh, produce meeting minutes, um, circulate copies of the meeting minutes. Okay, so this all really shows us that really this unit would best be um, assessed by a project where the students would actually have to create a meeting, invite people, um, make sure that all the equipment and resources was available, um, take meeting minutes, and then send the meeting minutes out. Okay, And as part of that project, you would definitely want to use the performance criteria as a strong guide as to what you would include in the project. Okay. And of course, you'd probably create a written test, and in the written test, you'd probably ask a bunch of questions related to these things. Okay, so now let's look at a different unit of competency, 
and we'll go through the same process. So this is a unit called SIRXWHS001 Work Safely. And this is a great unit because it can apply to many different industries, different workplaces. All right. So if we scroll down, this one's actually only got two elements, which is cool. All right. So we're going to come down, we're going to look at the performance evidence. Um, let's look at the assessment conditions first of all. Skills must be demonstrated in an industry workplace. All right. And, or a simulated industry environment. Assessment must ensure access to equipment and material requirement for the job role, organizational work health and safety policies and procedures, okay? So if we come up to the performance evidence, I really love this unit because it's really clear and simple to follow. So what we must see for this one is we must see the candidate follow organizational work health and safety procedures in day-to-day -day work activities on three different occasions. Okay. And they must demonstrate appropriate response to one emergency situation and they must report one workplace health and safety event. Okay, So this would probably show me that um, and tell the reader that ultimately what we're looking for, first of all, is that they show us they are following work health and safety procedures in day-to-day -day work activities on three occasions. So for me, that would indicate that we'd probably create an observation checklist. And as part of it, we would write down all the safety aspects that we would want to see the candidate be following every single day. And we would want to tick that off. Okay. So you create an observation checklist on that. Okay, then it, we want to see them demonstrate appropriate response to one emergency situation. Okay, cool. So we could um, have a mock scenario where it's a fire evacuation or a um, incident has gone wrong within a company. Maybe someone's got injured or whatever it might be. And the candidate must demonstrate to us how they would uh, react to that situation. So again, that would be another observation checklist. And then it says report one workplace health and safety event. All right. So that one there could be um, they fill out an incident report, okay, and uh, they could also um, have to tell the supervisor about what happened, and that could be a role play as well, all right? So here, if we sum it up in total, we got an observation checklist that's used three times. We've got another observation checklist here or a role play, and we've got... Um, Maybe as part of this role play here, we could include this one as well. Report one workplace health and safety event. Okay, so you can get creative as to how you are going to assess these things. Okay, so now coming up, we've got follow safety procedures as part of the um, elements here. We've got follow emergency procedures. So we would obviously weave these things into our assessment down here, okay? Then we're gonna uh, make sure that we create a written test to test uh, the knowledge evidence uh, for, uh, for these things as well, all right? So basic key um, aspects of the relevant state and territory occupation um, OHS or WHS legislation as it impacts individual workers. So a simple approach for testing knowledge evidence can be creating written questions such as, let's go for it, worker responsibilities. You could ask a question such as, what are two of your responsibilities as a worker um, in relation to safety? It could be another question such as, describe how you um, follow safety procedures each day. Okay. Um, and so you can create as many questions as you want, you know, making sure it's not overkill, but making sure that you do thoroughly test a candidate's knowledge of worker responsibilities. Next one, ramifications of failure to observe um, WHS legislation or any policy or procedures. Okay, so this one's another quite simple one. You could simply say, what are some of the consequences of failing to observe um, the safety rules within our company? Or another one could be, what are two consequences that a company could face if it doesn't follow WHS legislation? It could be another one of what could happen if you don't follow the emergency procedures for when a machine breaks down. Okay, so 
you uh, so let's pick another one safe manual handling awesome so a question could be um, what is the posture that you should take when you are lifting an item another one could be what is the max load that you should lift um, when carrying items or how would you coordinate a lift of a heavy item within the workplace okay so Hopefully you're um, catching the strategy that we're using here to test each of these items. All right, um, evacuations. Um, let's see what is the procedure for evacuating your building. Okay, um, another one could be who is the uh, fire warden in your organisation. Okay, so essentially we're coming up with questions to test whether or not um, a candidate would know how to do each of these things. So let's recap. All right. So the first thing we want to do is check out the assessment conditions. All right. Next thing we want to do, read the performance evidence. All right. And this is going to tell us um, or indicate to us probably the best ways to assess the um, skills of the unit. Okay. Then we're going to come up here and we're going to go. All right. Cool. What also needs to be included in each of our tasks? Okay. And then we want to come down here, the knowledge evidence, we want to create our written tests. Okay, So that's pretty much the formula that you would go through for any time that you're looking to build your assessments. Okay, So now let's head back to our slides. Alrighty, so... Now, we've talked about the best method, but let's go into a little bit more detail about when you would use each of the methods, okay? So the first one, first one that we're gonna talk about is observation. Now it's very useful when you need to see the student perform a skill or apply their knowledge in a workplace context, absolutely. Often you can tell if you need an observation um, by looking at the performance evidence, just like we did, section of a unit, and sometimes also evident from the performance criteria, okay? you must make sure that you do observe the skills of the unit, okay? How you observe them is going to be context dependent, okay? And sometimes it can be done in a simulated environment, sometimes it can be done or has to be done within the workplace, and certainly if you're doing it within the workplace, there's considerations that you have to have for you know, people around you, for distractions and uh, resources and equipment and creating the right conditions for sure, all right? So let's move on to the next method, which is project. Now, a project may contain a number of steps. A project may be something that the student has to plan for and implement and work on over a period of time. A project may actually produce a number of different types of evidence. For example, for the unit, make a presentation. You might require your candidate plan for the presentation, deliver the presentation, and then review the presentation. Okay? It just makes sense that all those aspects would be part of a presentation um, project that they would need to implement. Okay? Now, case study. Case study is basically um, a story or a situation that's presented to the student and then they need to answer questions about it. So it may be useful in situations where you need a student to show how they can apply their knowledge in different workplace situations, but the situation may not come up naturally during the course of assessment and it may be hard to actually create that situation. Okay, A case study often requires a student to read through information about the situation and then answer a series of questions about how they would respond to the situation. So for example, maybe you write um, you know, XYZ uh, machine broke down, um, you know, uh, how would you deal with the situation? Or it could be um, you have a difficult customer in the workplace, um, please describe uh, how you would deal with the customer and this is their customer's situation. Okay, So case studies are great because you can really map out a lot of different aspects and you can really um, come up with some great powerful questions to elicit a lot of knowledge from the student and um, potentially gather a lot of performance evidence quite easily as well. All right? Particularly in situations where you might need them to be doing something um, a little bit more, um, I guess, I don't want to say dangerous, but um, things that may not be so easy to create uh, within a simulated environment. Okay? 
So, role play. In a role play, students will be given information about a certain situation and then they will need to role play or act out how they would respond to that situation. Often a role play requires is carried out in a simulated workplace environment or it may need others, such as other students, to play different parts. Often the assessor will need to play a certain character during the role play as well. All right? so, it's important for a role play, detailed instructions are given to the assessor about how the role play will be conducted and expectations for performance. An assessor checklist is a must. Okay? So the assessor needs to know exactly what they're looking for um, as they conduct a role play or as they get these students to uh, participate in the role play. So for example, it could be watching a role play of a waiter and a customer at a restaurant. It, um, it could be watching a role play of a security guard um, at a nightclub, but obviously you can't just go to nightclubs, so you wouldn't um, have the security guard and the uh, mock um, patron actually act out the role play and you would be looking for great communication skills from the security guard and you would be looking to see how they reacted um, to the uh, to the potential patron and uh, the different things that could come from that okay so role plays great strategy very underused but it is a great strategy um, but you just need to make sure that your instructions to the candidate are as clear as possible and that there is a very clear uh, checklist for the assessor to fill out okay so written questions. Written questions are often used to demonstrate the knowledge required by the unit. They can often be the easiest to write. However, it is important that you always make the questions level appropriate. You don't want to make the question too hard or too easy or overly confusing. Okay? It's really, really important that when a student reads the question, they know exactly what they need to write and how much they need to write. Okay? Many times you see assessors fall back on going straight to written questions and sometimes written questions are very poorly written and a student's failing but it's not the fault of the student but how the question is being written. Okay? So, a third party report. A third party report or supervisor's report is used when you want to assess for soft skills and skills that may be needed to be observed over a period of time. So, for example, a third party report would often say, um, as the supervisor, I regularly see the candidate perform the following tasks. And it could be communicating effectively with customers. It could be dealing with customer complaints. It could be greeting customers um, in a nice, friendly manner. Okay? It could be uh, processing financial transactions. Okay? These things, um, they may not be observed in, a, in one particular instance. They may need to be um, observed or seen over um, a longer period of time, maybe over two or three shifts. Okay? So that's when and why we'd use a third party report. Okay? And you see a lot of RTOs going to a third party report too quickly. And ultimately a third party report uh, the supervisor must certainly be a qualified person and uh, you need to make sure that the criteria or things that uh, must be seen by the supervisor are very clearly understood um, by both the student and uh, the supervisor themselves. All right? You don't just want a supervisor ticking and flicking so to speak on that form. Okay, AQF, the Australian Qualifications Framework. We've talked about this a number of times but in the vet sector, you do need to be clear on the expectations for assessment and training against each of the different levels. All right, so I highly recommend and remind you to um, really get familiar with this chart. Okay, Get familiar with the difference between a Cert 1, Cert 2, Cert 3, Cert 4 and Diploma so that you can actually look at an assessment and go, mm, no, that's actually not a um, Cert 1 type assessment. That's not a Cert 2, that's not a Cert 3, Cert 4 diploma. Okay, and we're going to go through some of the ways that you can actually build a question, build a task to make sure it's a level appropriate. Okay, and the reasons that you would do that is to make sure that you avoid misassessing, i.e. assessing to the wrong level, Okay. Over assessing, i.e. assessing too much, or under assessing, not assessing enough. Okay. So you, over time you'll get familiar with these terms as well. Okay. So let's go and look at how do we make it level appropriate. Okay. So just a reminder, 
Just a reminder on the metaphor. All right, so cert one is, for example, doing a basic task. All right, so we picked the concept of the coffee shop analogy, the co um, coffee shop metaphor here. So cert one, make the coffee. So two, make the coffee to preferences, all right, different types, different alternatives. So three is about problem solving. So four is about supervising and training staff, all right, leading a team. Diploma is about managing and growing an organization. In this case, we've said a coffee shop. Okay, so just keep these um, different dynamics in mind as you're thinking about the different levels. All right, and if you're ever unsure about how hard to make your assessment, always come back to the AQF document, and you can find it quite easily by just going to Google and typing AQF. Okay, and putting question mark and you're going to find the AQF pretty quickly. All right, so you can read through the document and um, you'll certainly come across this chart. Um, but it will also step out the uh, expectations and descriptions for every single level that's out there. All right. So keep in mind, so one is regurgitate. So two is it, you know, getting the students to think a little bit more, um, a couple of preferences, a couple of options, all right, but it's still very limited, particularly in the area of responsibility, okay. So three is about problem solving um, and um, being able to work unsupervised, okay. Cert so four is certainly leading and taking responsibility for your own outputs in relation to specified quality standards. And diploma is taking responsibility for the um, entire group. Okay, diploma is about demonstrating and understanding, analyzing, planning, transferring, and applying theoretical concepts, evaluating information, and ability to forecast. Okay, so diploma is obviously a lot more complex than certificate one. So you have to keep these um, levels very clear in your mind as you create your assessments. Okay. So, instructional design works for written or verbal tests. The right question structure makes all the difference. Now, this section I highly recommend that you have your um, notepad available and you take a lot of notes because I'm going to show you some words and some question structures that you can use in order to build um, questions that are very um, specific to each of the different levels. And you're going to find this section quite helpful when you come to writing your assessments. Okay, So question starters. So certificate one, typically as we've talked about, certificate one is a regurgitate level. Right? So just going to basically tell us back what we told our candidates. So in that case, we want to keep our questions very tight and very specific. So we can use phrases like Tell me, tell me your name, tell me the policy for, um, tell me the year in which, okay. Next one, we can say what is X, Y, Z. Um, next one, true or false questions, very commonly found in certificate one. Identify, um, identify the body part that does whatever, okay. List, all right, another very commonly used um, instructional design word is certificate one. All right, now let's look at Cert 2. Cert 2, we're going to probably find a lot of what is, multiple choice, and how do you, okay? And if you use these types of questions, it is highly probable that you are going to write an AQF level appropriate question, okay? Now, certificate 3, how do you, okay? Describe. Um, describe your process for. Um, describe what a um, what a X Y Z is. Okay. Um, what is the legislation name for X Y Z, and why do we follow it? Okay. Outline. Okay. Outline the steps to. Okay. Um, so as long as you're using these prompters you're going to be off to a good start. Okay, certificate four, define, review, summarize, explain, outline, what if. Okay, so let's go into a customer service situation, retail. So it could be um, define um, the meaning of um, good quality customer service um, in our organization and please do it in uh, 200 words. Okay, review. Another one could be, let's say, review 
um, our customer complaints policy and um, what are three key attributes of it. Okay, summarize. So summarize our policy on uh, dealing with customers with special needs. Okay, and please do it in 200 words. Okay. Next, explain. Explain how you would deal with a um, customer that requests a uh, product refund uh, that you don't agree with. Okay. Next one, outline. Outline how you would handle an upset customer that was yelling in the store. In the store. Okay. What if? Um, what would you do if uh, the um, internet was not working within your organization? Okay, so obviously, you know, the content of the question is going to be dependent on what you're actually assessing. However, I just want to demonstrate some different ways that we could create questions using these words. Okay, now, diploma. Well, diploma, again, a high level of complexity, high level of thinking. We would go analyze XYZ, recommend, summarize. How do you or how would you define, outline, what if, how would you? and research. Okay? So hopefully you can see by the nature of these questions, we're asking a student to do a lot more um, when compared to a Cert 4. So for example, we might get a student to look something up and then actually evaluate that and apply that to their work situation. Okay? So hopefully you've written down these um, question starters, uh, going back to Certificate 1, uh, we got these words here. Hopefully you've written them down and you will, um, I would suggest create a bit of a notebook. Um, so in basically call the page assessment um, instructional design words and build up your bank of words that you can go to if you ever need to create assessments. All right? Really, really powerful and helpful list to have. Okay, Because as I said, you never want to make your questions too hard or too easy. Okay. And the more clear the question is, the higher the probability a student will be able to answer in the way that you want. Okay. Also, another part of this is you definitely want to include a uh, word count as much as possible. So, for example, with Certificate 3, you may include a word count of um, 20 to 50 words. All right. um, certificate 4, maybe you're looking at 50 to 100 words, up to 300. Okay, and then diploma, you may be looking at 300 words plus. Now, you may not put a word count on every single question. However, if you create a question like, um, you know, summarize XYZ, um, summarize our company WHS policy, well, obviously, it's a great question, but if you don't actually tell a student how much to write, it could be a bit rough because if you wanted to summarize a policy, that could take pages and pages. So you definitely want to give an indication of the length of a desired answer. Okay, so now let's look at some real life examples from a unit of competency and how you would actually take a criteria from the unit and actually create a question about it or um, yeah, mold it into an assessment item. Okay, so we've got performance criteria example. Number one, um, customer inquiries are responded to courteously and efficiently by phone and face-to-face. -face. Okay, so I'll, I'll just let that sink in for a second. We've gone to a unit of competency, this particular unit here. All right, we could look this up on training.gov.au and we can find this. And then the first performance criteria is customer inquiries are responded to courteously and efficiently by phone face to face. So as always, we need to remember, okay, our task as an assessor is to assess somebody's ability to do this. All right, so let's practice making a question. Okay, so, all right, certificate one, we can make a question such as, Please circle true or false. When you meet a customer in the shop, you should smile and say, how can I help you? Okay. And obviously, the correct answer is true. Okay. So that would be one question that we could create based on this thing here. All right. Next, certificate two, multiple choice. All right. As we discussed, um, certificate two, looking at multiple options, so a um, multiple choice approach could be a great way to attack it. So when you answer the phone in the store, which of the following greetings would be the most appropriate? Circle the correct one only. Hi, this is XYZ Company. My name is. How can I help you? B, we are busy. Please call back later. Hang up quick. 
all right so you, this is sam what do you want okay and obviously a student would circle a all right but hopefully you can see that this question is very clear it's very direct and a student would know exactly what needs to be done all right certificate three okay so in two to three sentences describe the process for dealing with a customer complaint and how you would do it in a courteous and efficient manner all right and um, you can certainly add to this um, a customer complaint on the telephone or you could say um, face to face. All right? You could be as specific as that if you wanted to. Okay. Summarize in four to five sentences how you might address um, and performance manager staff member that was not demonstrating courteous and polite manners towards customers. Okay. So again, this is a cert four um, level. So we're really ramping it up. Okay. But it's still related to customer inquiries. Okay. Next one, diploma. Develop three KPIs for your staff in relation to how um, customer inquiries should be handled at your, um, at your workplace. Describe why these would be the most appropriate to measure success. And as we've um, said, I've put in word count there. Analyze the top three complaints that your business received in the last month and recommend an improvement strategy um, for handling them. Okay, so let's review the principles of assessment. Okay, so ultimately, as we've talked about, we need to remember that for an assessment to be good, it must uh, meet the four criteria of being valid, flexible, reliable, and fair. So what does that actually mean? Let's remind ourselves that valid means that it assesses exactly what needs to be assessed from the unit. Okay? So in the unit, if it talks about elephants, Okay, let's just imagine elephants. But in the actual assessment question or task, you um, ask them a question about giraffes or get them playing with giraffes, okay? Then that task is not going to be valid, okay? Flexible. Again, this is talking about um, individual students' uh, context and situation. So this is about making sure that a student can do it via RPL, that uh, the assessment is as contextualized as possible and for example offers distance learning options okay reliable means that the markers guide is very clear so that all assessors um, provide a similar judgment okay reliable all candidates are answering the question in a similar way um, so for example if you have a question and everybody seems to be interpreting it a different way. Well, that's not a very reliable question. Um, another one could be, um, it's not reliable if um, in the uh, assessment instructions, it doesn't specify exactly what equipment's needed um, and exactly um, the length of time. For example, the assessment uh, needs to have aren't fair. Um, this one, you're definitely looking at reasonable adjustment and also making sure that the assessment does not discriminate against anyone, okay? So let's look at some actual real life applications of those um, principles of assessments. We are valid, flexible, reliable, and fair. So the assessment doesn't allow for reasonable adjustment. Is it not valid, flexible, reliable, and fair? All right, so hopefully you're writing down the answer as I say that question. Question two, question is convoluted and student doesn't know how to answer it. Is it not valid, flexible, reliable or fair? Um, three, observation checklist doesn't specify how long the practical task should go for. It isn't valid, flexible, reliable or fair. Assessment doesn't allow for it to be done online via distance. It isn't valid, flexible, reliable or fair. Number five, Assessment doesn't allow for RPL pathway. It isn't valid, flexible, reliable, or fair. The written test doesn't tell the candidate if it is open or closed book test. It isn't, um, okay, cool. And that's all that question, there's a bit of a typo there. Written question doesn't tell the candidate if it is open or closed book test, all right? So, coming back to the top. Assessment doesn't allow for reasonable adjustment. It isn't, probably we would say it isn't fair. Okay, question two. Question is convoluted and student doesn't know how to answer it. Well, we'd probably say the answer isn't reliable. All right, question three. Observation checklist doesn't specify how long the practical task should go for. 
Well, we'd again say for this one, it isn't reliable. Okay. Question four, assessment doesn't allow for it to be done online via distance. Well, in that case, we'd probably say it isn't flexible. Okay. Assessment doesn't allow for RPL pathway. Eh, it isn't flexible. Okay. Written test doesn't tell the candidate if it is open or closed book test. Well, in that one, we could say it isn't reliable. Okay. So, the more that you get used to applying the principles of assessment, actually see it in action, the more that you're going to be empowered to make great quality assessments and also be able to look back at the assessments you create and ask yourself, is that valid? Is that flexible? Is that reliable? And is that fair? Okay. So, in this webinar, let's quickly review because I like to do a review. All right. So, we've covered what is assessment, ways that we can assess. All right, the frustrations with each of the assessment methods. Okay, we've looked at the difference between tools and instruments. Okay, we've looked at choosing the best methods for um, everything that you need to assess in a unit, whether you would choose um, more demonstrative uh, methods or more knowledge based methods. Okay, we looked at different uh, units there, and we looked at um, the mental process that we would go through in order to build the assessments. We looked at when we would observe someone, when we would do a project, when we would do a case study, when we would do a role play, when we would do written questions, when we would do a third party report. We looked at the AQF again and we looked at creating level appropriate questions. Okay, so set one, set two, set three, set four, diploma. All right, and we looked at a real life example from a unit of competency and created level appropriate questions for that performance criteria okay awesome and we reviewed the principles of assessment okay and we did a bit of activity to apply those principles of assessment all right so hopefully all of that has made sense to you and as I've continually mentioned with the assessment cluster it is a cluster that until you actually start making assessments it doesn't really make much sense. All right? So once you dive deep and actually play with units of competency and play with making assessments, then you're going to get more and more of an understanding of it. Now, at the end of this series, I should be able to give you any unit of competency. And regardless of your background, you should be able to create um, good basic assessments, be able to create a good basic observation checklist, a good basic written test, um, a third party report if you had to, a role play um, if you had to. And you'll find that the more practice you get with creating assessments, the easier it gets. Just like training delivery, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Okay. Now with assessment, obviously, there is no such thing as a perfect assessment. And we are always looking to improve our assessments over time. Okay, so in the next webinar, we'll be going through the exact um, instructions that we will put on an assessment. Uh, we'll talk about the different policies and procedures that need to be in place for assessment. Um, but one of the best things that I highly recommend that you do is go out there and look at different assessments. Also review any assessments um, that you have on hand in your own organization if you're already working in an RTO and start to review the questions and think, okay, cool. Is this a reliable question? Um, is this a question that's really clear for students? Um, is this question asking too much of students or too little of students? Um, and bring it back to the Australian Qualifications Framework. Look at your Cert 1, your Cert 2, Cert 3, Cert 4 deployment courses and go, huh, is this question reliable? Is it not? And what could be tripping up students and um, where could it be potentially going wrong? Okay. Also look at the unit and look and check, is everything from the unit actually being assessed or not? All right. And the more that you do this, the more that you'll start to understand compliance and uh, the importance of principles of assessment and rules of evidence. Okay, So in the next webinar, as I said, we're going to cover off the instructions that you would write and um, how you would design the assessments overall. Okay, So thank you so much for watching this webinar. If you have any questions at all, feel free to um, send them into the TAE graduate group. Um, otherwise, uh, send an email to Success Training Academy and we'll endeavor to get back to you as quick as possible. And then, of course, we do have the Advanced Trainer Bootcamp where we will help you take your delivery skills up to the next level. So thank you so much for your time, energy and focus. And it's been our pleasure to present this for you. Thank you so much.